Hey guys, it's Will, nursing educator inside Corsetta. Today we're gonna to go over fluid and electrolytes. So we're gonna make it super easy and simple to understand for you guys. Now, as you guys probably already know, fluid and electrolytes is a huge concept in fundamentals of nursing, but it's also gonna help you better understand lots of other concepts later on in nursing school. So it's really good that you deeply understand these concepts. Now let's get right into it. Don't forget guys, we have a fluid and electrolytes free study guide and worksheet that will help you better understand these concepts. So follow along with us and write the notes that you need that go directly along with this video. All right, guys, so let's go over potassium. Now, potassium is probably the one of the most commonly questioned electrolytes inside your nursing exams and on the NCLEX. So let's get right into it. Hypokalemia versus hyperkalemia. Let's first start with hypokalemia. Now, potassium is actually extremely simple, so don't overcomplicate it. So potassium is there. Its function is just to conduct the nerves to cause a muscle contraction. Now, since the heart is a muscle and it runs off of nerve conduction, it's a huge concept with potassium in relation to the heart. So hypokalemia, potassium is always going to tell you the truth. Low potassium, low nerve conduction, low muscle contraction. So signs and symptoms, the number one concept that's questioned about is the heart rhythm. What does hypokalemia cause? It's low, so a low ST and a inverted T wave. So low potassium, we think low rhythm. So we got a low ST, a low T wave or inverted T wave, and then a prominent U wave is sometimes seen. So make sure you guys write that down. Now remember, hypo and hyperkalemia both cause cardiac arrhythmias, but we're going to talk about hyperkalemia more because it's more likely to cause those serious heart arrhythmias. So like I said, potassium is going to tell you the truth. If we're low in potassium, it means we're low in muscle contraction. So think of all the things that contract. We got muscles, paralysis, so low deep tendon reflexes, low muscle function, and then we have low hypo active bowel sounds. This is huge. The GI system is heavily affected by potassium. It's going to cause hypoactive bowel sounds, which puts them at risk for what? Small bowel obstructions. So that's one of those key concepts that gets commonly questioned about for hypokalemia. So remember that. Common causes of hypokalemia, so anything that causes potassium loss, such as vomiting, diarrhea, and diuretic use is one of those top threes that causes hypokalemia. All right, so hyperkalemia. So anything over 5.0 is considered hyperkalemia. So once again, potassium tells you the truth. It's very truthful. We're going to have a high amount of muscle contraction, nerve conduction. So think with the heart, high, high peaked T waves. This is commonly questioned about on your nursing exams and NCLEX. You're going to want to write that down. High peaked T waves is a very common concept. Okay, so let's continue on with the actual heart itself. So hyperkalemia, once again, high nerve conduction, high muscle contraction. So the heart itself has a high muscle contraction. So this is going to cause those serious arrhythmias such as VFib or VTAC because it widens the QRS complex. It takes the heart longer to actually contract. There's so much potassium, there's really not any time for it to relax. So it's really hyper and stiff. And then going off for the musculature, hyper reflexia, potassium tells the truth, and then hyperactive bowel sounds. Common causes of hyperkalemia is number one kidney failure. That's another common concept they'll ask about. There are also certain medications they like to ask about as well, such as ACE inhibitors and potassium sparing diuretics. And lastly, anytime there's a trauma or burn, it's going to cause hyperkalemia because potassium likes to stay in the cell. When there's a trauma or burn, it leaves the cell because of the damage and it gets in the vasculature, which causes a high amount of potassium in the vasculature. All right, guys, so sodium, so hyponatremia versus hypernatremia. Now, before we get into comparison here, sodium is a key player in water balance, guys. So remember this, sodium sucks. Water follows sodium everywhere. So if there's a high amount of sodium, that water is gonna come to balance that sodium out. So wherever there's a high amount of sodium, you can expect water to come following. Let's start with hyponatremia. So anything less than 135 is considered your hyponatremia. So signs and symptoms of hyponatremia, I want you guys to remember this, salt loss. So S, we have seizures. A, we have abdominal nausea and vomiting. L, we have lethargy and confusion. T, tendon reflexes diminished. L, limp muscles. O, orthostatic hypotension. S, stupor slash coma. And then another S, stomach cramping and spasms. Now, there's two types of causes of hyponatremia. We could have dilutional, which means there's a large amount of water in the vascular space, which dilutes the sodium there. And then there's also direct loss, which is just simply excreting sodium at a high level, such as using diuretics, is another common concept to ask about. But many times with hyponatremia, you're going to see patients with heart failure. You're going to see patients with liver cirrhosis or kidney disease because the water builds up in that vascular space and dilutes the sodium. And now we have hypernatremia. So anything above 145. So for signs and symptoms, you want to remember high salt. So H, hyperthermia. I, increased fluid retention. G, greatly increased urine output. H, hypertension. 
S, skin flushed and dry. A, agitation. L, low-grade fever. And T, for thirst. One key term they like to use is dry mucous membranes. That's a sign of hypernatremia. So guys, since sodium is so closely tied with fluid, so think the causes of hypernatremia is a fluid deficit. So there's a high concentration of sodium because there's not a lot of fluid in the vascular space. And then there's also, of course, just excessive intake of sodium. So common conditions is diabetes insipidus and use of diuretics and an inadequate water intake. So this is common with geriatric patients because they have a decreased sensation of thirst. Hey guys, it's Wilker Patrick, nursing educator in Corsetta. I wanted to let you guys know that I will help you with anything you need at any time if you just send me a text at 940-218-4062, 940-218-4062. Let's get back to the video. All right, guys, so next is calcium. So calcium also, just like potassium, has a function for muscle contraction and nerve conduction. First, starting with hypocalcemia. So anything less than nine is hypocalcemia. Signs and symptoms. So you're going to hear this most frequently, Shavstex and Trisal sign. These are your number one signs and symptoms that are commonly questioned on your nursing exams and the NCLEX. So Shavstex is a facial twitching when you tap the cranial nerve, so the facial nerve. So think cranial nerve starts with a C, so cranial, and then Shavstex also starts with a C. So think Shavstex is that cranial nerve tapping, which is the facial twitching associated with hypocalcemia. And then Trousal sign is the flexion of the wrist when you inflate a blood pressure cuff because it's irritated nerve conduction and muscle contraction once again because it's low calcium. Other key terms you might hear is tetany, numbness, and tingling, and which is also called paresthesia. With hypocalcemia, everything gets agitated. Everything's tight and contracted. So also think that they are also at risk for seizures. So hypocalcemia, make sure you guys write this down, that it has to be on seizure precautions. So any patient with hypocalcemia, seizure precautions. And there's hypercalcemia, so anything greater than 11. It's the exact opposite of hypocalcemia. They're going to be slow, lethargic, not very good deep tendon reflexes. And a lot of the times, guys, write this down, they will have confusion and cognitive changes. Risk factors. So risk factors is commonly questioned about for hypercalcemia. So when you have hypercalcemia, you're at risk for renal stones and fractures. Now, thankfully, guys, we're moving on to magnesium. Magnesium is very similar to calcium, but magnesium is a major relaxation effect. Magnesium is very relaxing to the body. So when we have hypomagnesemia, which is less than 1.5, there's not a lot of relaxation going on. We have hypermagnesemia, which is greater than 2.5. There is too much relaxation going on. So first starting off with hypomagnesemia, it's going to be very similar to your hypocalcemia, which you could have, once again, Shostex and Trisal's sign. Since you're not very relaxed, you're going to have high blood pressure, high heart rate, high respiratory rate, and just simply symptoms of anxiety. And once again, guys, you're going to want to know seizure precautions with both hypocalcemia and hypomagnesemia. Then there's hypermagnesemia, so there is too much relaxation going on. So a lot of times, remember this, this is the number one thing that's questioned about, is that they are at risk for respiratory depression. Their respiratory rate will be too low, and their ventilation is also too low, so they're not oxygenating or ventilating correctly to maintain life. You can really think of magnesium as a sedative medication, so when they have too much, they're just way too relaxed. They're not going to be alert. Their blood pressure is going to be too low. Their heart rate is going to be too low. So I actually had a patient one time with hypermagnesemia, and their vital signs, it really does make a huge difference. Their heart rate was super low, their blood pressure was low, and we didn't have a renal panel come in yet so far, but when it came through, it was very obvious their magnesium was super high. So the antidote for this, guys, is calcium gluconate once again. If there's too high of a magnesium level, then calcium gluconate is your antidote for that. All right, guys, so lastly is phosphorus. So phosphorus is pretty much the opposite of calcium. So when we have hypophosphatemia and hyperphosphatemia, it's directly reversed from calcium, so hypocalcemia and hypercalcemia. And that is because they are both controlled by the parathyroid hormone. So they have a direct inverse relationship. So hypophosphatemia is going to have the same signs and symptoms as hypercalcemia. They're going to have weak muscles, slow deep tendon reflexes. And then once again, just like hypercalcemia, they're at risk for confusion and cognitive changes. And then there's hyperphosphatemia, which is over 4.5. This is related to a lot of kidney patients, so a lot of kidney patients will be on a low phosphorus diet because of this. Once again, signs and symptoms are just like hypocalcemia. Shostex, Trisals, hyperreflexia, increased deep tendon reflexes, and once again, risk for seizures, write that down. If you guys haven't already, make sure you guys download our free fluid and electrolyte study guide so that way you guys can take notes 
and remember these concepts better. Thank you guys for watching. We'll see you in the next video. Hey guys, first of all, thank you so much for watching the video entirely through. It makes our day if we know that nursing school got a little bit easier after watching one of our videos. If you guys like this video, make sure you like it, subscribe to the channel for more, and drop down in the comments for any more ideas that you need help with nursing school. If you want to contact me personally, it's 940-218-4062. Thank you guys for watching. We'll see you in the next video.